Hello everyone, welcome back to the first Reading with Raptors for the new year in 2021. Um, I thought today would be a great day to hang out with our resident turkey vulture who right now is trying to get a rat head out of this egg carton um, because this is our oldest resident raptor here at the Raptor Center at 47 years old. And that's important because with the new year, every bird in North America is considered to be one year older. This is my favorite fun fact of this time of year. Since we don't know exactly what day every bird in North America actually hatched on, could be anywhere from February through August, depending on the species of bird and if they were the first or the second clutch of the year for particular species, we don't know. So in order to kind of make it nice and standard across the board, ornithologists or our bird scientists consider every bird to be one year older on January 1st. So we are all mentally adding on a year to the birds that live here in their ages. So this turkey vulture is now 47 years old. It's been teaching people about turkey vultures for most of that time. So like I said, he just kind of dug a rat head out of this egg carton. So we'll see what else he does with it. But because we're talking about our oldest resident raptor here at the Raptor Center, I thought it would be a great day to also talk about some very, very, very old birds with this delightful book I have had my eye on for a bit here called Feathered Dinosaurs of China. Um, specifically China, because there's a region in China that we'll talk about in this book um, that has had an amazing variety of fossils discovered in it. Um, this particular book is actually from 2004. Um, most of the information I checked out um, to kind of verify that most of it was still uh, accurate and relevant, and a lot of it is, even since this book came out, um, there have been a lot of amazing discoveries um, all across, uh, especially Eastern Asia. There have been a ton of amazing finds, um, especially relating specifically to feathered dinosaurs, the ancestors of birds. So I thought this would be a great day to talk about that. And this book has some delightful illustrations, a lot of great information, a lot of scientific names that there is a pronunciation guide in the back that I am basing them off of. Um, so if I pronounce any of these maybe differently than how you have heard them before, if you've heard them before, then it'll just be a fun surprise as we go along. Um, but it should be really exciting. So we're gonna let our turkey vulture here continue to practice some of those excellent scavenging skills by trying to figure out if there's anything else left in this egg carton. And we're going to read Feathered Dinosaurs of China. This is by Gregory Wenzel. Let's speak up here. And here's right away on the back. We're actually gonna see this picture again. This is the first page right away. You can see a feathered dinosaur running through some kind of underbrush. Here is a map showing China and then up here near the Korean Peninsula is an area called Liaoning. We're going to talk about what that is. Some of the best fossils ever found are being discovered in ancient lake beds in China. Not just an animal here and a plant there, these fossils show a whole ecosystem including feathered dinosaurs. Scientists are getting a rare look at a prehistoric world. Unusually fine details are preserved in these fossils from Liaoning province. They show the delicate wings of insects, veins of leaves, fragile skin, feathers, and soft anatomy, such as internal organs. Many animals are fossilized as complete skeletons with all of the bones in their proper positions. These clues tell us about the dinosaurs that roamed prehistoric China. Paleontologists know that one type of dinosaur likes to eat tiny mammals and lizards. How could they tell? The mammal's bones were fossilized in the dinosaur's stomach. Unlaid eggs are visible in the fossil of another dinosaur. There are even examples of color patterns on the fossils of insect wings and dinosaur tail feathers. So here are some drawings of the examples of these. Let me scooch this over slightly so we can still see our turkey vulture here. So here's an example of a drawing of one of these. So here is the kind of fossilized version of what that fossil actually looked like. And then here is kind of the, as best as we can tell, a reconstruction of what this animal actually looked like. 
Here's another one with these, looks like a kind of fern or a plant where you can actually see the details on that plant. Oh, here's some more. I'll hold this over here so you can still see our turkey vulture, but I'll show those again. The layers or strata in the Earth's crust where we found these remains are called the Yishan Formation. They date from the early Cretaceous period 124 million years ago. Millions of fossils have been excavated or dug up from the Yishan sites. So far, hundreds of different fish and invertebrates that lived in the lakes have been found, some preserved as entire schools of fish or beds of clams. Beautifully preserved remains of reptiles, dinosaurs, mammals, and birds record what life was like around the margins or the kind of shoreline of the lake. Plants and insect fossils fill out the picture of the environment where these fascinating creatures made their home. Based on the fossil evidence, we can recreate the prehistoric ecosystem of the Liaoning Lakes. So here are some more of these fossils or drawings of what those fossils looked like. These are based off of the actual fossils that were found. So you can see here, it looks like a turtle. This one looks a lot like a fish, maybe some minnows and other small creatures. Here's an insect preserve. Here is one where you can actually see the feathers, the imprint of the feathers that were made. Here's a rendition of what this might have looked like. Let's step back 124 million years. The scene looks nothing like present day northeastern China. It is a flat, or excuse me, it is a vast flat landscape dotted with shallow lakes and ponds. Covering the land are forests filled with dense vegetation and exotic trees. A diverse community of creatures, both familiar and strange, thrives in this warm green environment. We'll spend a day meeting some of the inhabitants, including the extraordinary feathered dinosaurs. Here in the background, we have our turkey vulture is currently doing some preening, cleaning off and rearranging those feathers. So here is the scene that we will be talking about here. This one actually looks pretty familiar to me. Here is the other side with this frog and a dragonfly and some very unusual looking plants. The morning sun climbs above the treetops, bright light shimmering on the lake. Dragonflies zoom low over the water as they hunt for insects. Fallen trees lie half submerged along the shoreline, their bleached trunks lined with basking turtles. There are lily pads on the surface of the water and a tangle of reeds and horsetails growing along the waterline. In the damp shadows, salamanders hunt for tiny arthropods. A calobotrachus, a small frog, watches a dragonfly. A flick of a sticky tongue and the insect is breakfast for the amphibian. Tree ferns, cycads, and cypress border the lake where the constant hum of insects is occasionally broken by the loud call of a bird. Another very warm day is beginning. Nearby, twigs snap and feet rustle the dry leaves. Something big is moving. So here again, you can see those turtles basking. Looks like some sort of crocodile over here. 124 million years ago. This is what we think it looked like. Here is the picture. Here's the other side of this herd. A herd of Dinjausaurus is foraging for food in the forest underbrush. These are some of the largest of the Liaoning dinosaurs, up to 20 feet or six meters long. As they feed, their heads swing from side to side, sniffing off, snipping off plants with their horny beaks. The sharp edges of the beaks shear plants like scissors. Flat grinding teeth chew the leafy matter before it's swallowed. The Gingosaurus are related to the Iguanodon, which lives in Europe during this time period. Usually on all fours, they rear up on their hind legs to reach foliage or leaves on high branches. After plucking off mouthfuls, 
the dinosaurs drop back down to eat. Like many large herbivores, the Jinjiaosaurus spend most of their time eating. They can eat all of the plants in one spot in minutes, so the herd keeps moving. Their shuffling feet kick up the litter on the forest floor, flushing insects and small animals into the open. So here's that one rearing up to reach those tall leaves, since they need so many of those leaves to stay nicely fed. So here's the picture on this side with this Gingelsaurus and this tiny creature I think we're about to find out about. And here's maybe from more of the tiny creature's point of view. Let's read about this. A Gingelsaurus steps on a rotted log. The furry mammal hiding underneath barely avoids being crushed and scurries to find new shelter. This is an Eomaya, no bigger than a mouse. Its sharp pointed teeth show that it feeds primarily on insects. Mammals of this time are tiny nocturnal creatures. In a world dominated by agile hunting dinosaurs, it's safer to hide during the day. As the huge Jinjiaosaurus browse, many small creatures are scared from their hiding places. Beetles and other insects fly up with every footfall and lizards rush for cover. A sign ornithosaurus hunts for prey disturbed by the herbivores. The feathery predator is alert to the slightest movement. So here is this tiny little Aomaya, this tiny, it looks like a kind of almost mouse-like creature running around. And then here is that sign ornithosaurus, this tiny little bird-like creature, dinosaur, compared to the size of this very large herbivore. You can see why they might be scuttling around. Some more preening from our turkey vulture here. Here is this side of the sign ornithosaurus chasing after the tiny little or uh, Aomaya. Here it is looking like it was probably successful, grabbed onto that tiny little mammal. The sign ornithosaurus belongs to the dromaeosaur family of hunting dinosaurs. The inside toe of each foot has a large curved claw poised to catch and hold prey. Folded against the body, its arms are covered in long feathers and look like wings. Just visible beneath this plumage are three long feathers with sharp claws. Hair-like feathers cover the rest of this five-foot-long theropod, a meat-eating dinosaur. The Aomaya is sent scrambling again, and the eagle-sized predator is after it. In a flurry of leaves and twigs, the sign ornithosaurus stops, nearly crashing into a fallen tree. The Aomaya is held firmly by a big foot claw. Sharp, recurved, serrated teeth lining the hunter's beak make short work of the meal. The hunter moves on to the lake shore. I love this picture because it reminds me a lot of what a lot of our raptors look like now, holding onto food with their feet. But you can see a lot of differences like this creature still has teeth in that very long snout and has three fingers or kind of little claws coming out of the end of those wing-like arms. Very interesting. Here, I really like here, you can see, I'll see if I can point to it. Uh, there, you can see the kind of white fluffy down feathers that he is uncovering as he preens. Oh, here it's a lot of different pictures. Here's this very large one of two flying dinosaur, or two flying creatures, I should say dinosaurs. And then our uh, Sinornithosaurus over here in the corner. Let's see what they're up to. Near the water, two pterosaurs squabble over a dead fish. The Sinornithosaurus startles one of them in Aeosipteris into flight. Aeosipteris. The Aeosipteris is the bigger of the two flying reptiles with a wingspan of four feet or 1.25 meters. Its wing is an expanse of skin stretching from the side of its body attached to the edge of a single long finger. Tiny stiff rods in the skin called actinofibrils keep the wing rigid during flight. 
Short, thick fur covers the rest of the body to insulate this warm-blooded flyer. The smaller pterosaur, a dendrorhynchoides, dendrorhynchoides, snatches the prize with needle-like teeth and quickly flies away. A large flock of birds glides into perch in the trees along the shore. These are Confuciornis, the most common Leonine birds. Unlike modern birds, they have three-fingered hands with sharp claws on the inside of their short wings. They look like the hands of theropod dinosaurs. The males have two very long ribbon-like tail feathers, most likely used for display and to attract females. On the ground below, something moves in and out of the shadows. So I really enjoy this page a lot because here we have three different kind of uh, creatures here. This one is a dinosaur. You can see it had those kind of long, almost wing-like arms. These two are both pterosaurs, which were actually not dinosaurs, but they were ancient reptiles that lived around the same time, but are not actually related that closely to dinosaurs. And then here we have this flock of very early birds, the Confuciornis, and you can see they really resemble birds a lot more than either of those other two. So these are um, kind of related to the ancestors of our modern birds. You can see those feathers, those long tail feathers. Couple differences still. You can see that there are a lot of differences between them and our current birds with the kind of fingers projecting different kind of mouth shape. That page was just really exciting to me. So here is another incredible scene. Here is the one side. You can see this small bird-like creature walking around. And here it is encountering something that looks an awful lot like a modern crocodile or alligator and a couple of turtles. Let's find out. A caudipteryx, a small theropod, remember those were these upright walking carnivore meat-eating dinosaurs, so a caudipteryx, or a small theropod, heads to the shore for a drink. It stops to peck at small, rounded pebbles scattered in a dry stream bed. The caudipteryx has no grinding teeth, just a row of forward-pointing teeth at the front of its upper jaw. It swallows these little stones to help mash food in its gizzard, a part of its stomach. The caudipteryx passed it by several Manchurosuchus sprawled on the sand. Manchurosuchus, that's these uh, kind of uh, crocodile and alligator relatives. When it gets too close, one of the crocodilians lunges. The theropod leaps into the air, spreads its striped tail feathers, and opens its arms wide. Together, the arm and tail feathers make an effective threat display. With a squawk, the caudipteryx lands safely out of the crocodilian's reach. Turtles, startled by the commotion, drop into the water. Another, let's follow this turtle as it goes down into the water, see what else is going on. There are a lot of very interesting creatures down here. I'm very intrigued about what this one is. The rest of these look kind of like creatures we see today, but this one is really interesting. And then here is another, looks like a reptile, but let's find out what it is. On the lake bottom, a soft shell turtle, a manchurokelis, buried itself in muck. Tadpoles, tadpoles wriggle past a colony of clams. The lake bottom is alive with small creatures. Snails graze on algae on submerged leaves. A dragonfly nymph lies in wait to ambush its tiny prey. Aquatic insects, worms, small crustaceans, even small fish. Huge mayfly larvae, nearly three inches long, wave leaf-like gills along their side. That must be what this is. A mayfly larvae. Interesting. Many fish species live in these warm waters. Some lurk in the shadows under lily pads, hunting smaller fish. Others, such as the Protocephorus, detect small prey by probing the sediment with their snouts. A school of tiny Lycoptera is gliding through the water, but suddenly darts away. 
a hyphalosaurus, a lizard-like aquatic predator, is coming. Its long neck arcs from side to side as it searches for small fish and insects. So here we have this fish is kind of searching down in the dirt, in the mud at the bottom, looking for delicious animals to eat. And then here is that kind of lizard-like aquatic predator, the hyphalosaurus, chasing after these fish with that very long neck. Here we have up close something that does look very familiar, a cicada. Those very loud insects we hear during the summer when they make that very loud droning noise. And then here is two more dinosaurs, lots of feathers on these. Let's find out about these. Back on shore, Leonin creatures seek shelter from the midday heat. The high-pitched drone of cicadas fills the air. In the shade of tree ferns, a pair of bipausaurus stays cool by panting. Like all feathered creatures, they're warm-blooded and can overheat when it's hot. At seven feet or two meters long, the Bakiosaurus are some of the largest feathered dinosaurs known. Feathers, many more than one foot or 30 and a half centimeters long, cover their bodies down to their feet. Their arms are fully feathered as well, and their hands tipped with recurved claws. Although these claws look fearsome, the Bapiosaurus feed on plants. Maybe the claws were used for defense or to help dig for food. This is something I always find so interesting about fossils and trying to figure out what animals use their different body parts for. Trying to figure out what these claws might be useful for is a fascinating puzzle. Again, our turkey vulture doing lots of excellent preening. He pulled out the rat head earlier, but doesn't seem as interested in eating it. Seems more interested in preening. So here is a nice close-up of another interesting walking dinosaur and something that looks much more like a modern lizard. Let's see what's up with that. Oh, well, we see what happens to the lizard here on the next page. On the lakefront, a four foot long or 1.2 meters, Sinosauropteryx swishes its long tail as it searches for an afternoon meal. With 64 vertebrae, or those bones in your spine, its tail is proportionately the longest of any known theropod. Its small arms, tucked against its body when it runs, are not covered with broad feathers like the sign Ornithosaurus and Caudipteryx. The arms have the same hair-like plumage that covers the rest of its body. A lizard suns itself on a piece of driftwood eyeing a striped moth nearby. The Sinosauropteryx spies the potential meal and dashes forward. Before the lizard can react, a clawed three-toed foot pins it in place until sharp teeth, sharp teeth snap it up. The lizard's tail still dangling from its mouth, the Sinosauropteryx freezes and cocks its head. There's activity in the distance. It swallows the scaly snack head first and moves off to investigate. Let's go see what's going on over there. Ooh, very interesting. What is going on here? It looks like a very large dinosaur and some feathery creatures here. And then here are two of them maybe fighting over some of that carcass. Let's find out more. Near the water, the Sinosauropteryx finds a family group of Microraptor scavenging the carcass of the Psittacosaurus, a type of horned dinosaur. The Microraptor is truly tiny, the smallest adult dinosaur known. Just 14 inches, I'm sorry, just 16 inches or 41 centimeters long, it could rest in a human hand. It's a dromaeosaur and, like most hunters, will take advantage of a free meal. The Microraptor flock protests noisily, but they're no match for the Sinosauropteryx. They pester the intruder while it feeds. The Sinosauropteryx eats its fill and moves on. The Microraptor family moves back to feed and is joined by several birds that snatch small pieces off the carcass. These are Protopteryx. Like the Confuciornis, they have three-fingered hands with sharp claws. As they squabble over the carcass, 
it's hard to tell dromaeosaur from bird. So this one here on the ground, that is a dinosaur, that theropod dinosaur is a microraptor. And this one here is an ancient bird, the Protopteryx. So these two look very similar. These are kind of like distant cousins. You can see some of the uh, very big group resemblances, huh? Oh, big stretch from our turkey vulture. You can see those long wings. Talking about wings on these birds, and this, uh, this bird and this dinosaur. You can see that big long wing of today's modern birds. Here are two of those birds flying through the air. And then up here, looks like some very big creatures with some of these smaller walking animals. Let's find out. One Protopteryx, with a small piece of meat in its beak, takes off towards the trees. Another gives chase. The two birds fight for the meat in midair. As they quarrel, the morsel is dropped. A Protoarchaeopteryx, Proto a smaller relative of the Caudipteryx, has been watching the fight. It snatches the scrap as soon as it hits the ground and speeds away from the pursuing birds. The small dinosaur eludes the Protopteryx by running into the herd of Gingiosaurus. They take little notice of the theropod. The Protarchaeopteryx runs off with the scrap in its beak to give to hatchlings in a nearby nest. So you can see how small this theropod dinosaur is compared to these Gingiosaurus. And these were the largest uh, dinosaurs that were found in this particular fossil site, though certainly not the largest that we know of in the world. But for 124 million years ago in northeastern China, they were the biggest. Here's a beautiful large picture. You can see this kind of whole scene unfolding with a lot of the different creatures that we've been reading about. I'll try to keep at least half of it here. Long shadows of late afternoon stretch over the landscape. The Jinjiaosaurus stir from their heat-induced rest. Many head towards the lake to drink. Pterosaurs wheel lazily on the warm air, while birds of all kinds flit from tree to tree. The Microraptor flock, full from their meal, rests in a thicket as a pair of Cyanornithosaurus picks over the Psittacosaurus carcass. At the water's edge, the Caudipteryx is interrupted mid-bath by the thirsty Gingiosaurus. It tries to scare them with its feather display, but the towering plant eaters are not impressed, and the Caudipteryx is forced to retreat. Down to the shoreline, the Cynosauropteryx is hunting again. It may get lucky and catch a night creature that came out too early. In the fading light, a chorus of frogs begins to croak. As the day ends, we leave Liaoning. There's one more picture here. There we go. So here is the kind of the aftermath. So this is going to talk about how we came to know a lot of this information. Here is another fossil. So you can see this bird laying here, and then you can see that fossil many, many years later. Let's find out a little bit more. During the time of feathered dinosaurs, volcanoes would periodically shower ash and poisonous gases on the lakeside communities. Animals would die and sink to the bottom of the lakes where they were quickly covered in accumulating sediment of volcanic ash. Rapid burial prevented decay. It allowed the soft anatomy to remain intact and the fine grain of the ash preserved structures in minute detail. These special conditions are the reason for the high quality of the Yixian fossils. Not all of the plants and animals were killed in these eruptions. The survivors would gradually reclaim the environment and thrive until the next volcanic event. Over long periods of time, this process repeated itself building up layer after layer of entombed organisms. For millions of years, the fossils remained hidden in the Earth's crust. Eventually, the sedimentary layers were pushed up by geologic forces and uncovered by erosion. Today, paleontologists find beautifully preserved feathered dinosaurs in these ancient lake beds. These feathered remains help us understand more about dinosaurs. 
Plumage on Liao Ning's theropods suggests that feathers were a common feature in many types of related dinosaurs. We know that dinosaurs were warm-blooded since they were wrapped in nature's most efficient insulating device, feathers. Only animals that produce their own heat and maintain a constant temperature need to be insulated. Birds and dinosaurs share over 100 similarities in their bodies, including hollowed bones, clawed three-toed feet, unique ankle and wrist joints, and feathers. Based on the evidence, we can say that birds are not only the living descendants of dinosaurs, birds are dinosaurs. We can think of all modern birds as living, breathing, feathered dinosaurs. One thing I didn't notice when I first looked at this picture is you can see the fossil of this feathered dinosaur here with all the tools that are used. And here in the background are some of their modern birds. Very, very, very distant cousins. Oh, and then that is the last page. This was the glossary and index. I will say there's a little author's note that I'll read because I think it's very interesting. Dinosaur discoveries are still happening today. I've been lucky enough to be a part of dinosaur excavations in the United States as a staff member for the Judith River Dinosaur Institute, an organization specializing in the excavation, preparation, and study of Cretaceous dinosaurs in Montana. Recently, that group excavated a juvenile rack Brachylophosaurus, there we go, Brachylophosaurus specimen, one of the most complete dinosaur fossils ever found. Creating illustrations of dinosaurs takes imagination as well as scientific knowledge. Looking at bones and fossils is just the first step. Interpreting the evidence based on an understanding of animal anatomy provides the information I need to picture dinosaurs as living animals. Here's a note on the pronunciations, which I'll mention since I used a lot of the pronunciations in this glossary. Scientific names of plants and animals are made by combining two or more Latin, Greek, or other root words. Pronouncing these names isn't always easy, and many dinosaur experts disagree on the right way to do it. The pronunciations I used here keep the root words separate and distinct to help you find similarities among the names. So here is that list of um, all the different dinosaurs and other creatures that were in this book. So that was Feathered Dinosaurs of China by Gregory Wenzel. And again, this one is from 2004. And as I was saying earlier, a lot of new discoveries in the same region, along with a lot of the rest of Eastern Asia, has found a lot of other really exciting fossils, especially as they relate to our ancient birds or our bird kind of ancestors. So this has been really exciting. If you're interested in learning more about this, um, there are lots of really good resources. I'll see if I can drop a couple of links um, to some of the information about some of our more, um, more updated info on our feathered dinosaurs. But I was gonna quick scroll back and see if I missed any questions about either what this turkey vulture is up to or any other questions that came up in the book. So I'm gonna just quick scroll through here. I saw somebody who is really excited about uh, turkey vultures being featured today. Um, they are really incredible to see soaring through the air. You could see when he was, um, sorry, I'm making the thing wiggle. Um, you could see when he was stretching out those long wings while he was preening and kind of uh, relaxing. You could see those long wings are perfect for really soaring through the air. Here in Minnesota, we're not gonna see our wild turkey vultures kind of outside, out in the environment for a few more months. Probably won't see them until closer to May or so, depending on kind of the season. Um, but it gets a little bit too cold up here up north. Um, maybe some of you who are watching in warmer parts of the US or even Central or South America might be seeing turkey vultures year round. You might also have other species of vultures near you. But for us, it gets a little bit too cold, so we won't see them soaring through the air for a few more months here. But hopefully, if you live in a little bit warmer climate, you might see some of them around. They are very important scavengers. Um, they actually will help to break down large carcasses. One of my favorite facts about vultures in general is in areas where we don't have vultures, it takes large carcasses or dead animals 
almost four times or longer to fully decompose. That's four times longer for those dead animals to be spreading diseases to other animals and even us. So having vultures around is very important. Those scavengers that really help kind of break into those carcasses, spread all of that out, really kind of get that decomposition process started. Our big flying scavengers do a really good job of that. And turkey vultures especially are really well suited to the job. You can probably see whenever he surfaces his head from all the breeding that he's doing, you can see he has that really kind of featherless head. He's got kind of really short, fuzzy, bristly feathers there. And then he also has, when he turns his head, maybe I'll move this down a little bit so you can see him a little bit closer up as we wrap up here. If you can see when he does turn his head, you can actually see through where his nostrils are. So he is actually able to smell very well. A lot of birds don't seem to have much of a sense of smell, but turkey vultures really rely on that sense of smell for finding their food. Since they're looking for things that aren't moving, it might be kind of hard to spot them from the air, but having a really good sense of smell, you can imagine, can help when you are looking for things that are starting to decompose. So that is our resident turkey vulture. Might be coming down here to <laughs> come investigate. We still have this um, nice egg carton here. So I'm trying to adjust the camera a little bit so you can still see him. So you still have that kind of egg carton there. He might be checking out to see if there's anything left in there. So let him keep playing with that. I think that was all of the kind of questions and comments for today. So thank you all so much for joining us here. As always, I've put a link in the description of the video um, for if you are interested in seeing more of our birds up close and personal, um, definitely check out the links there. It's a link to our website for our uh, raptor sponsorship. Um, so you can actually help support this turkey vulture as well as our other education birds by checking that out. So give that a look. Otherwise, you can always check us out at theraptorcenter.org or continuing following our Facebook page here. We're also on Instagram as well, so you can check those out. Otherwise, everyone, I hope your new year is off to a great start. You continue to have a great rest of your day. Thanks so much for joining us and talking about feathered dinosaurs with our turkey vulture here. Have a great rest of your day, everyone.